control and just pick up the one that contained the target. We have no hypothesis at this point as to whether this is a heightened sensitivity of some normal sense or whether it is some paranormal sense. Now, we are repeating the experiment with a different target object. One of these cans is filled with room temperature water. Again, the can was filled by an outside person who randomized the position of the cans. Then the box that contained the cans was rotated by a second person so that there is no one person in the room who knows the location of the target can. As you can see here, there is less hand motion by Geller over the can. The protocol, as before, involves his calling out the number or pointing and one of the experimenters removing the can at Geller's call. At this point in time, he is asked to make his choice both by writing the number down as well as making a selection by hand. You will note that he is making a final test to be sure of his selection. Tentatively, he reaches and, having made the selection, now looks to see whether water is inside the can. He now waters the plant by the contents of the can. You will note he is very pleased with finding this target because he had doubts at the outset whether he would be able to locate a can filled with water. We repeated this type of experiment 14 times. Five times involved a target being a small permanent magnet. Five times also involved a steel ball bearing as the target. Twice the target was water. Two additional trials were made, one with a paper-wrapped ball bearing and one with a sugar cube. The latter two targets were not located. Geller felt that he didn't have adequate confidence as to where they were, and he declined to guess and passed. On the other 12 targets, the ball bearing, the magnet, and the water, he did make a guess as to the target location and was correct in every instance. In subsequent work with another subject, we found the subject experiencing a highly significant difference in his ability to find various targets as compared with finding the steel ball bearing. The whole array of this run had an a priori probability of one part in 10 to the 12th or statistics of a trillion to one. Here is another double-blind experiment in which a die is placed in a metal box, both box and die being provided by SRI. The box is shaken up with neither the experimenter nor Geller knowing where the die is or which face is up. This is a live experiment that you see. In this case, Geller guessed that a four was showing, but first he passed because he was not confident. You will note that he was correct, and he was quite pleased to have guessed correctly, but this particular test does not enter into our statistics. 
The previous runs of 10-can roulette gave a result whose probability due to chance alone is one part in 10 to the 12th. We decided at the outset to carry out the die and box experiment until we got to a million to one odds, at which time the experiment was terminated. Out of 10 tries in which he passed twice and guessed eight times, the eight guesses were correct and that gave us a probability of about one in a million. We would point out again there were no errors in the times he made a guess. This is the first of two experiments in psychokinesis. Here, a one gram weight is being placed on an electrical scale. It is then covered by an aluminum can and then by a glass cylinder to eliminate any deflections due to air currents. The first part of our protocol involves tapping the bell jar. Next, tapping the table. Then, kicking the table. And finally, jumping on the floor, with a record made of what these artifacts looked like so that they could be distinguished from signals. In tests following this experimental run, static electricity was discharged against parts of the apparatus. A magnet was brought near the apparatus, and controlled runs of day-long operation were obtained. In no case were artifacts obtained which in any way resembled the signals produced by Geller, nor could anyone else duplicate the effects. On this chart recorder printout, the bottom four signals show the type of artifact that results from tapping or kicking the table. They are small AC signals with a time constant characteristic of the apparatus. The upper two traces, on the other hand, are apparently due to Geller's efforts. They are single-sided signals, one corresponding to a 1,500 milligram weight decrease, the other corresponding to an 800 milligram weight increase. Those types of single-sided signals were never observed as artifacts with any other stimuli. We have no ready hypothesis on how these signals might have been produced. The width of the signals produced by Geller was about 200 milliseconds. The chart ran at one millimeter per second. It was of interest to note that Geller's performance improved over the period of experimentation starting with 50 milligram deflections and arriving at 1,500 milligrams. In this experiment, Geller attempts to influence a magnetometer either directly or by generating a magnetic field. The full-scale sensor